everyone, Dr. Mirna again, welcome to our second lesson in this Introduction to Geography course. Today we're going to start with the Physical Geography part. In this lesson, we're going to talk about how the mountains have been created. So we'll mainly talk about two issues, the internal factors and the external factors that shape the Earth. The internal factors are the continental drift and the plate tectonics, and the external factors are weathering, sorry, erosion first, weathering, and then deposition. And we'll talk about how soil is created as well. So if we cut the earth, we see in the middle the core. The core has two parts, the inner core and the outer core. They're both made of iron, but the inner core is a solid iron because of the enormous amount of pressure that prevents it from being able to melt. And the outer core is molten iron due to the intense heat it's under. And the Earth's outer layer is called the crust, made of solid rock, and it's the thinnest part of the entire Earth, the thickness of the crust depends whether it's part of the land or part of the ocean. The oceanic crust is thin and dense, but the continental crust is thick and less dense. And also the earth is made up of a layer called the mantle. Like the core, the mantle has two parts, the lower mantle and the upper mantle. Together, they make up 84% uh, uh, of the Earth's volume, while the core is made up of iron, the mantle is made up of solid rock, so those are the basic components of the Earth. Let me introduce you to a guy by the name of Alfred Wigner, 1880-1930, Wegner was a German climatologist who studied the polar regions of Greenland. Wegner developed a theory that is essential to understand the Earth's continent. He saw that the continents almost seemed like they fit together like a puzzle. He is not the first one who saw this, but Wegner was the first person who found evidence to show that they actually fit together at one point. He found that Africa and South America both had rock formations that did match up whenever you move the continents together. Then the, the discoveries of fossils and the same prehistoric animals and plants that were found on several continents even though they were a thousand miles apart. And once again, when you move the continents together, the fossil evidence came together. This led to his theory that the continents move and at one point they were all a supercontinent known as Pangea. What Wagner proposed is what we now know, the theory of continental drift. But what was the reaction to the rest of the scientific community? In fact, they thought that he was crazy. And part of the problem was that Wagner wasn't geologist, a geologist, and the geologist asked Wagner to explain what made these continents move, but he couldn't do it. So the geologist used this against him to be able to discredit his theory. And unfortunately, Wagner died when he was 50 years old and he never got to see his theory accepted like it is today. But how his theory got accepted after? It's when the geologist named Harry Hess use the new piece of technology sonar. It's a radar for water. He realized that sonar could map the floor of the oceans. And he discovered that the earth has seams that divide the oceans and the crust of the earth into plates, tectonic plates. 
then research continued till 1960s and he discovered that the ocean floor nearest these seams were much younger than the ocean floor furthest away from these seams. This gave a solid evidence to support Hess's idea that the ocean floors was spreading. And this explained Wagner's theory of continental drift. So what causes the ocean floors to spread? The answer is convection. The convection is the circular motion that happens when warmer matter rises while the cooler matter drops down. In general, we see uh, convection in gases, atmosphere, in liquids, ocean, and in solids, mantle. The convection is uh, thought to occur in the asthenosphere, where the upper layer of the Earth's mantle is much molten than the plates above it. So the magma will rise up and it's stopped by the crust, which is hard rock. This leaves the magma spreading underneath of the crust, but while it does, it begins to drag the crust and breaking it. Where the crust breaks, the magma will fill in and be cooled by the ocean water and became new crust. This explains why the youngest crust is always by these ocean seams. Now, there are three major ways that the plates of the earth move. They can move away from each other, as we see in the middle of the ocean. We call this diversions. They can move towards each other and collide. We call this conversions. And they can move alongside each other, which we, ca which we call this transforming plates. So diverging plates are created through magma convection. The longest of these diversion boundaries is actually underneath the Atlantic Ocean, something which we call the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. On land, a diversion boundary will create what is known as a rift valley. The longest rift valley is the Great Rift Valley in Africa. Now, due to magma that push up and create new crusts, volcanoes are common near rift valleys. This is why the Great Rift Valley is home to a great number of volcanoes. Now, most landforms are created by convergent plates. There are two types of convergent plates. It depends on the type of the plates that are involved. If you have two continental plates collide, they will fold up on each other. We call this convergent folding. The Himalayas in Asia that includes Mount Everest is a good example of this. The Himalayas were created when the Indian continental plate collided with the Asianic plate, and this process is continuing today. The Mount Everest is still growing around half inch every year due to the convergence folding. Now, if we have oceanic plate plus oceanic plate or oceanic plate plus continental plate, in this case, we have convergent subduction. Because oceanic plates are much denser, when they collide, it's going to force down below the other into the mantle. And it doesn't matter if there is two oceanic plates or ocean plate and continental plate, it's enough to have one oceanic plate colliding. So this is the convergent subduction. During subduction, some of this mantle is going to melt, rise to the surface and create a volcano. This is why areas where there are oceanic plates colliding with other plates were often going to find uh, volcanoes. Caribbean islands is an example of a subduction zone. The largest subduction zone of the world is the Ring of Fire. 
The ring of fire surrounds the entire Pacific Ocean and includes the western coast of North and South America and the eastern portion of Asia. There are over 400 active uh, volcanoes in the ring of fire. 75% of the world's volcanoes and 90% of the world's earthquake are found in the ring of fire. Now, what is earthquake? An, earth an earthquake is a sudden shift of the Earth's plates. The strength of the earthquakes is measured by using the Richter scale. The strongest earthquake in history happened in 1960 when a 9.7 earthquake hit Chile in the ring of fire. Now we will talk about the third type of plates, the transform plates. Because of the huge pressure on the crust, the Earth's crust sometimes going to break and these cracks in the crust are called fault and this is where the earthquakes will occur the most. The most famous fault is the San Andreas Fault Line in the United States, California. It is a transform plate where the Pacific plate is moving north and in the north, the American plate is moving south. Whenever these plates split, uh, sorry, slip, California has an earthquake. Earthquake can be devastating on land, but if an earthquake occurs on the ocean, then it can create the tsunami. Now, tsunamis are common in subduction zones. They are caused when subducting plate begins to drag down to the other plate. Now, pressure is going to build up and this other plate is going to shift quickly upwards. When it does, it's going to displace the water above the earthquake, creating a wave of energy. Example, in 2004, a 9.1 magnitude earthquake in Indonesia created a tsunami that killed nearly 20, sorry, 230 people uh, in this area. So we talked about the composition of the Earth, Wagner continental drift, about how convection currents within the Earth create continental drift and plate tectonics and how plates tectonics create landforms, we can call these the external, sorry, the internal factors as they shape the earth from inside. Now we are going to talk about the external factors, how the earth can be shaped from the outside by the effects of weather and climate. These external factors are erosion, weathering, and deposition. And we will talk a little bit about how soil is created as well. So we start by weathering. Weathering is the process of breaking rocks into smaller and smaller rocks until you get something called sediment. The sediment, mud, silt, and gravel has been worn down by weathering process there are two major types of weathering, physical weathering and chemical weathering. Physical weathering is the breaking down of rocks, but without changing the chemical composition of the rock. This occurs by mechanical forces. This process usually begins with small cracks and these small cracks could be created by the heat of the sun or when water is absorbed into a rock, it will start to make cracks. Example of salt water, salt water in areas near the ocean may also create these small cracks. When salt is deposited in the rocks, the salt crystals will expand and break the rock apart. Example of vegetation also, vegetation could also play as part where plants grow into rock and the roots will force the way into the crack. Then we will move to the chemical weathering, 
which is going to break down the rock by changing the actual chemical composition of the rock. Example, rust. Rust occurs when oxygen reacts with iron, breaking down the metal in the process. This is called oxidation. When we have red color of the rocks, this is a sign of oxidation occurring in the iron found in the rocks, turning them red and weathering them down. There is also the chemical weathering of limestone when carbon dioxide in the atmosphere combines with, wa with water, it will create a chemical reaction with the limestone that eats away the rock. Human activity can also contribute to chemical weathering through pollution. Air pollution combines water va vapor in the atmosphere to create the acid rain. So when it rains, this chemical will eat away the rocks. So weathering breaks down rocks into sediment through physical and chemical weathering. Now, when sediment is moved, this is called ero erosion. Erosion is caused by wind, water, ice, and gravity. Whenever the energy of these forms is strong enough to be able to pick up and move the sediment. Example, the wind erosion. Most common to find a wind erosion in flat areas such as deserts and beaches where the sediment is exposed and there is anything to block the wind. But areas with vegetation tend to have less wind erosions because trees will block the wind and the plants tend to hold the sediments. Water erosion, ocean waves beating against the, coast, the coastline will take the sediment out to the sea. Erosion will happen also in streams and rivers Grand Canyon, which was formed by the erosion of the Colorado River. Another type of erosion is glaciers. A glacier is a large mass of ice that flows slowly over the Earth's surface and they can be huge. Example, the Lambert Glacier in Antarctica is the world's largest glacier. It's more than 60 miles wide 270 miles long and almost two miles thick. So large glaciers, they can deform the Earth's crust due to their huge weight. So they are able to move not only sediment, but large rocks. And due to their size, they cut U-shaped valleys along their way and the material that is pushed to the side by the glaciers is called moraine, which can create hills surrounding the valley. The fourth type of erosion is gravity. Rock slides and mudslides are examples of erosion by gravity. So when rock is constantly being weathered by chemical and physical weathering, now over time the rock is no longer able to win the fight against uh, gravity, it's end up by falling down. <coughs> then there is deposition. Deposition occurs whenever the force eroding the sediment no longer has the energy to continue carrying a sediment. A great example of deposition is the creation of a river deltas. So when the river slows down, it will lose the energy and it will deposit the sediment creating delta. And as another example of wind deposition are the sand dunes. In Europe, the North European plain has some of the most fertile lands. The wind deposits a fertile sediment known as loss across the plain. We know how soil is very important to human development and settlement. It's where we practice our agriculture. And what is soil? 
Soil is a combination of four things, sediment, air, water, organic material, which provides the fertility for plants to grow. Organic material or decaying plants and animals, anything that used to be alive but no longer is, also known as humus. Humus is important because it provides fertility to the soil for plants to be able to grow. So the positions play a major part in transporting material to be able to create soil. It's also contributing to the process of creating rock, especially sedimentary rock. As sediment is deposited over a long period of time, anywhere between thousands of years to millions of years, a process called litification takes place. So litification is a process in which the material is buried by other material and then a chemical reaction of the sediment, water, organic materials bond the sediment all together. This is called cementation. Sandstone is a perfect example of a sedimentary rock. This occurs in area that was once covered by sand. In fact, underneath the Sahara Desert, we actually find sandstone. Now, what is interesting is the same external forces of weathering erosion are also applied to the sedimentary rock as part of the rock cycle. And now we talk about the external factors that shape our earth, which are weathering, that break down the rocks into smaller rocks, or sediment, erosion that moves the sediment and deposition that drops that sediment down the earth. So now we will end up this course. I will see you in the next lesson of this physical geography part, climate and weather. Until then, keep on learning.